Uh, now, <clears throat> I realize this group is quite different from many that I speak to. I speak to people with an interest in the fiction of this. This is a novel, you know, and it, it, uh, the best way to describe it would be it's a dramatization of what would happen if the Seattle Fault were to go uh, tomorrow, say. Um, so we're, uh, we're gonna, what I'm gonna do, however, is to, uh, knowing that this is a technically uh, savvy group, I'm going to focus very much on the research that I did in preparing to write this novel. This, uh, this book took me three years to write, and most of that time was spent going and, you know, I did some fun things. I uh, got a tour of the, the ferry uh, or the, the fireboat Leshai from its captain, uh, things like that in order to get, you know, uh, valuable information on uh, what, what would happen in the waterfront and that sort of thing. So um, <clears throat> without further ado about the story, well, you know, maybe I should just give you just a little more background. It's the kind of story where, you know, there are uh, out of towners who are on the space needle when this event happens and they witness it from that perspective. There are people in skyscrapers at restaurants uh, and uh, driving on the freeways. You know, it's kind of prophetic. Uh, I wrote about people driving on the West Seattle freeway going across the bridge which of course now is closed uh, and it cracked right where I said it would crack. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'll probably spend a little more time on that in the technical part of this presentation. So anyway, um, moving along here. Now, uh, again, I realize this group, I'm going to guess that most of you know what the Seattle fault is, but I don't want to present that way. I want to make sure that everybody is brought along with this. So I'll spend a little time. You just saw a picture of it, but I'll go into more detail on that. Uh, what is the Seattle Fault? How dangerous is it? What specific face threats do we face? And I've got a little asterisk there, especially stadium goers. So, you know, usually when we talk about the Puget Lobe, we don't worry if it's going to crush a crowd of uh, people at a, a, a football playoff game, but in this book that becomes an issue. And in fact, in researching what it would be like in the Seahawks stadium, I uh, came to realize there are uh, some things that our city planners might wanna look into and I'll get to those a little bit later. Uh, and then finally, what can native legends teach us? And, you know, there really is a wealth of lore, some of it pretty informative to scientists, I believe. Um, so here's the beast that we're talking about, and I, I showed it on the cover of the book there a moment ago, but this dotted line is the approximate location of the Seattle Fault. It is an overthrust fault coming from the south and going north. Uh, so that every time that there's an earthquake on that fault, it rises on the, the lower portion here and the land subsides above. In fact, there, has, there are, are some discussions in the literature about whether Elliott Bay really is nothing more than uh, a, a subsidence due to the overthrusting of what's to the south of it and really some data really supporting that. So that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, other things that are on this map that are notable is if you look in West Seattle, you'll note that the fault line goes right off Alki Point and it goes right over to Restoration Point on Bainbridge Island where there's both a point and a, a, a valley or a, a channel that, that goes up there and those are surface manifestations of the fault. And again, because this group, you know, is well versed in uh, the Puget Loeb glacier that came down across this area, it scraped things, you know, not necessarily smooth, but uh, flat in general. 
And uh, so the fact that there are two points facing across the sound right there has to do with the fact that since the Puget Lobe melted, these areas have been thrust upward out of Puget Sound. And let's see, is there any other thing I wanted to point out here? I think not. Well, the other thing maybe just is this fault has been traced from the Cascade foothills all the way over into uh, uh, Hood, Hood Canal. And it's one of many faults in the area. Tacoma, you know how Tacoma also has a point like ours. Uh, and if you look right up there in Magnolia, there you can see two matching points from Bainbridge and uh, uh, West Point. <clears throat> I'll have a lot more to say about West Point in a while. But the, the land is breaking repeatedly in this crosswise fashion with the thrust. What it is is a compression north to south. And, and the, the Seattle Fault, unfortunately for Seattle, is uh, a very substantial part of that. OK. Um, so I think I've said everything I want to say about that slide. Whose fault is it? Is this, has, does this have anything to do with the continental subduction zone, which of course is the one that everybody talks about. They go, oh, we may have the big one. And the big one, of course, is uh, when the whole coast slips and the, the uh, ocean crust slides under uh, all, all of Washington State, Oregon, up into BC. And we are not talking about that. There, there could possibly be some connection, but really not much because this is the second thing here. It's a local crustal fault. The crust is kind of jiggering around on top of the floating continental plate and it's adjusting and squishing and crunching to fit whatever contours the ocean floor and the continent have provided for it. And then the question, which is more dangerous? Well, wouldn't you think that when they when they tremble and fear over a 9.0 magnitude uh, subduction zone event, that that would be worse than some of these things we see around here that are 6.3 or whatever. You know, the, the, I think the uh, Nisqually back in 2001 was 6.1, I believe. I'll be double double checking that. I've got it written up ahead here in one of these slides. Yeah, that, that would be 6.8, Tom. Mm. I'm getting it mixed up. OK, um, I'm sure we'll see that in, in my notes ahead. Um, and then the question, uh, a simplistic question is, which is more dangerous? I mean, here we are in Seattle. We're, you know, 50, 60 miles away or even more from where things would slip on the continental plate. But th the bad news is that you could stand in West Seattle and your feet would be on the fault. And that is significant. So let's have a look. So size matters, but so does distance. And you know, when you get an event on the subduction zone, that's shown in the middle of this image uh, with the red dot there. That's the, the main area offshore where uh, you get big slip events. And uh, the Seattle Fault is shown here uh, over uh, on the, uh, you know, in the Seattle area, the, the little dotted red line. And indeed, little, you know, the magnitude, the size of these things is tremendously different. By the way, let me ask people, are you seeing my arrowhead right now by Seattle? I don't know if that, that may not yes. be. Yes. No. Yes. Good. So in case I need to point anything out, I will. Mainly, I just talk my way through these slides. But uh, uh, anyway, so you can see that the faults are very different in size. I mean, extremely different. But these things go by something approximating the inverse square law so that, uh, I mean, it isn't that simple, but it's pretty close to it. Uh, by the time something's propagated from out offshore, it has diminished quite a bit, whereas again, if it's under your feet in Seattle, it hasn't diminished at all. So uh, it's it's a moot point, and I, I kind of hope we never find out which is worse. But uh, 
you know, this won't be the first time this fault has gone off. That's why those landforms are there. And there's other uh, evidence. Um, so I covered this. It, it thrusts up from the south where it runs underwater there, as you see on the left. Um, that when you push the land or, or the bottom up in a, in a big way, you're going to generate a big wave. And uh, there's plenty of evidence that that has happened in this area. Um, some features, I have uh, some film, or it's not really a film, it's a bunch of stop motions uh, that is kind of small in scale. So let me point out a few things to bear in mind as we go along. Um, first of all, the stadiums down here, T-Mobile and uh, the Seahawks Stadium are right, uh, well, we all know where they are. Harbor Island, uh, just start out emphasizing its landfill, bad news in an earthquake. Um, and of course, Starbucks headquarters, I mean, if that were disabled, the whole city would probably grind to a halt immediately. So we have to worry about that. But I, I'm also going to point out um, uh, some other areas like way up in the uh, upper left, West Point, where they have found Native American uh, uh, remnants of a, 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 if not a village, then at least a camp where they uh, took shellfish and cooked them and there are shell middens and stuff. Um, so this is the scenario that we're working with where a tidal wave might be generated after an earthquake. And the time frame is you've got about five minutes. Now I, I've spoken with city planners and uh, including fire department, uh, uh, other other people um, about how they would respond to an earthquake in Seattle, and I tried to draw a distinction between the fault, go, the the earthquake, and uh, the the tidal wave that might follow. And I was a little surprised to hear. Uh, uh, I got this from uh, Cody Shriver, who's the uh, chief planner for the fire department in the cities planning for emergencies. And it really surprised me. I said, well, what, what would you do knowing, you know, there's been an earthquake and now you've got poss the possibility of a tidal wave? What's the plan? And he said, well, for our alarm, we wouldn't be able to respond any quicker. So we don't actually have a tidal wave plan. We would assume it would be an earthquake with tidal wave by the time we could respond. <laughs> that didn't entirely, you know, set me at ease. <laughs> um, so I got to thank Nick Zentner for, for this wonderful photo. I think it was taken from a drone. This is, I'm going to just jump back quickly. Here we are over here, restoration point on the lower left. Okay, we're going to have a look at that and then over at Alki Point. So restoration point is interesting at least twice, if not a whole bunch more times. Once, because this entire area with, which is nice and flat and they've you know made lawns and some golf links and whatever on it. The reason it is sitting there uh, about 20 feet above sea level, it used to be the shore. It used to be the, the tide flat. And when the earthquake of uh, 900 AD struck this fault, it was lifted right out of the water and and up that high and the other interesting feature you can see there are striations throughout this and these are not entirely clear as to what they are but this is one con this continuous strata right through here and it looks very much to me at least i don't know that this has ever been scientifically verified it looks a lot like a wave pattern of a wave coming from the south and going to the north and shattering the ground here. We'll have a little look at it overhead. You can see that uh, here's here's the longitudinal lines, and there there are crossing lines, almost like cr crisscrossing ripples in this rock. And this is one of the native uh, legends, uh, not of this specific place necessarily, but they have, among other legends, the legend of the day the rocks exploded. 
and it's a little bit vague you know you, you can't get anybody to pin down what they mean when they say that but it was the day the rocks exploded and if you look in this area uh, right in the center here you can see that some of these pieces don't necessarily look like they're in their proper line uh, one could imagine those be, they would have been underwater when this event started so i really doubt that it was here but you could imagine that those would be tossed around by a, a quake of that magnitude perhaps we'll never know but again native legend the day the rocks exploded this is a look uh from another angle just at how general all those striations are and uh, how flat this area is raised up by the AD 900 earthquake. Same thing over in West Seattle. However, there's a tremendous amount of building on top of it. So it's obscured most of it. You can see over on the left, a few of those striations again. I used to play on this beach when I was a kid. So I'm very familiar with these long rows of rock. It's, it's good solid rock, sandstone, uh, limey marl or something like that but it's it's a uh, hard rock that has been broken in these patterns and again here this was lifted up from its below sea level to above sea level in the 8900 event so uh i alluded to this earlier let's let's have a look at um, the next really scary item uh, this was done uh, back in April 20, two, 2002, uh, modeling a 7.3 magnitude earthquake on that fault that we were just looking at. And uh, I got to thank Vasily Tidov. I, I never met him, but he left this nice model. And what I'm going to do, I, it, it was a, a motion picture. I've just taken stills from it. And I hope that uh, if I go through them quickly, they'll They'll feed across the internet quickly, but if, if not, I'll have to go slowly. So, um, and by the way, in, in the Great Seattle Earthquake, I pushed this up a little bit to a 7.8 quake because I wanted to get it into the realm where buildings might fall. But I, in my story, I did not knock down the city. I can't stand that kind of a horrific story. Mine's more a story of survivorship than, you know, mayhem. Uh, but I did get it up to where, uh, let's just put it this way, one unscrupulous builder who hadn't properly reinforced the building that he was in uh, lived to regret it, and he didn't live long. Okay, so here is uh, Tidov's model, and you can see, that presumably, you know, the fault has just ruptured and has lifted the seafloor up, say, somewhere between 20 and 50 feet would be a reasonable amount for this kind of an event. And at 0.5 minutes, there's a tsunami shaping up here. And we'll, fo we'll follow it a little bit. So it's coming along, crossing the sound and starting to curve around. And by 1.5 minutes, everybody in the marina at, uh, <laughs> at Magnolia is, uh, you know, hope they are <laughs> heading for high ground. Um, and it strikes magnolia and then does what is very common with uh, tidal waves. It, it will uh, reflect back out. See that? And one thing that you get very often, especially in enclosed areas like Elliott Bay, you get the, the waves just bouncing back and forth. Uh, there's a thing called a seich or seish that uh, uh, can sort of rock the water back and forth in an enclosed area. And there's, it's a little uncertain to what extent that would play a part in this kind of an event, but it very well might. And also, by the way, notice up here, uh, you're just getting an impact on uh, West Point. And that again was hit by the 8900 quake and all trace of human inhabitation ended at that there's a stratum of a couple of feet deep of uh, tsunami sand and it it wiped out what, whatever living was being made there and buried the shell middens and other things under the sand. So we're at three minutes at this point. And I'll remind you, I said, you know, uh, 
if you're in the stadiums, you know, three minutes, you might have sort of recovered from your initial shock. Um, so what's going to happen next? And I'll get to that in just a little while. But I mean, but bear, just keep those stadiums. Keeping that's an old picture, by the way, of the kingdom. <laughs> but uh, keep the stadium area in mind because it, it's going to figure very much. And of course, now there's also uh, a uh, freeway tunnel that goes down right there at, at sea level. So here we go. We're moving along. Three point five minutes. The reflection and the first signs of something coming ashore in Seattle. The wave has really swept the Seattle waterfront. Uh, fortunately, you know, it wouldn't go too far uphill in Seattle because we have a very nice steep hill. But that mud flat area is uh, not a happy place. So at five minutes, you see five and a half minutes, it's starting to come ashore by the stadium. It's hitting uh, Harbor Island as well. And uh, the container terminals going under by six and a half minutes. And again, I'm going to tip my hand as to what I'm going to get to later. Imagine if the crowd was flowing onto the street out of the stadium at this point. Poor choice. 6.5 minutes, seven minutes, the water reaches uh, what was once the kingdom. Uh, 7.5, surrounding, overwhelming, eight, Harbor Island going under. And again, one of the things I'm concerned about, Harbor Island is a landfill. Uh, you wonder what happens when you load extra weight on top of that landfill. Um, and by the way, have a look up in the upper right at, at the, uh, that area. Um, see how there are crisscrossing waves. It's a scary thing. And I, I think this model might underplay how many crisscrossing waves there would be in, within Elliott Bay. I kind of made a big deal out of that in the novel with a fireboat having some great adventures on wild waves like that. Uh, okay, so let's keep going. Eight and a half. We're not done yet. <laughs> Eight and a half. Now it's getting, you know, goodbye Starbucks. We'll, we'll have to get our drinks elsewhere. Uh, Harbor Island's under. The whole stadium area has been completely swept over by 10 minutes. Now, one thing, you know, if you think about it, if you really were in this area, um, 10 minutes, you know, it isn't very much time. On the other hand, if you knew what to do and you got going, you know, you could keep yourself from, you can tell what I'm talking about here. You know, it's almost certain death if you're on the street, but uh, you don't have to be there. You, you do have some time before this gets this bad. And I think I can run it out now too. Uh, 12 minutes, I think is the, yeah, that's, that's it. Let's back up and just, uh, so you can see that uh, 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 an earthquake of the size that's easy, well, this was their choice to model it at 7.3. They didn't think that that was out of line. That was a NOAA model. Uh, I made my wave a little bigger, but as I say, as a fiction writer, I want to make sure I have all the dramatic elements in my story. So but I also didn't want to get ridiculous. So I stopped at what I hoped was a reasonable level. Okay, so we've seen this problem. So now let's talk about emergency evacuation plans. Well, you know, I, I, I wonder in this group, you know, uh, and speak up if you have an opinion, um, how many of you know what the evacuation plan is for uh, the, the Seahawks stadium? You know, uh, if you were in a playoff a g a game crowd and uh, it was packed, you know. Anyway, uh, so let's let's talk about some of these guidelines. And I'm not going to be giving you entirely happy uh, outcomes here. You know, there are the stadiums. There's the only thing between them and the the waterfront is uh, a flat container terminal. Um, and the, the whole so Soto area being built up on a mud flat, it's in general about 16 feet above the mean sea level, but really only uh, about eight feet above mean high tide. And the big spring tides get to where, you know, the sound is almost to the brim and you're, you're as little around the stadium as little as about four feet. Uh, and 
you know, waves. I mean, anybody who's chased waves on the beach or just gone for a stroll on the beach knows there's phenomenon of, I think, the technical term. You know, when a wave spills on the shore, then across the sand, it runs up and it goes higher than the wave was. So, uh, you know, you really, it, even just a two or three foot wave would jump the shoreline and come into this area. And uh, anybody who's been knocked down in the surf knows it really didn't even take three feet to do that. So, you know, let me just say this, I am being an alarmist. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna have a, some kind of happy, uh, hey, wait, you know, here's what we can do. This is a problem, I think, and I uncovered this in researching my novel. I mean, I did really painstaking research and talked to many people uh, and emailed, you know, corresponded by email, uh, University of Washington. And I'm not really satisfied with the responses they gave. So let's continue with that. I won't, I don't want to, you know, belabor it forever, but uh, this is last year's FEMA Great Shakeout. I don't know how many people in this group might have participated in the Great Shakeout this year. It was in October, a couple of weeks ago. I participated in it, as I'll get to in a minute. Uh, I missed it last year, but I went and double checked about it. And this was their poster, protect yourself during earthquakes. And it gives all the different examples of when and what to do where, you know, if you're in your office or if you're at home, you know, you're going to, you're going to drop cover and hold on, right? That's their message. And then, you know, in a heartening way, I was glad to see what in, in panel seven, they've got what to do on the waterfront good. And they've got what to do in panel nine, if you happen to be in a stadium, you know, so this is good. I'm going, you know, great. I'm glad that you uh, are doing this, but I looked further and uh, I got to say one thing. I'm glad that in this year's great shakeout, this document was not available. Maybe it's because I started asking around to the authorities why they said what they said, because look at this stadium advice. Okay. See, so here drop, Cover, hold on, those are the perfect things to do. And the next one is, then walk out slowly. Okay, well, six minutes from now, a tidal wave might hit. This is bad advice. And I pointed it out to the various <laughs> authorities that I could find to talk to. Uh, and by the way, again, this document was not part of the great shakeout this year. It was a, you know, it was a national document. This was not made for Seattle by Seattle. It was made, you know, for Denver Mile High Stadium or, uh, you know, wherever, you know, where, um, where they, they don't have a tidal wave threat. Uh, they didn't add tidal wave into their stadium advice, but we have to consider that. And then the waterfront advice was pretty good. I don't know about walk quickly to high ground. Boy, I'll tell you, if there's a big shake in Seattle, I'm running like mad for high ground. Because uh, as I point out over here on the left, the, if you're in the Soto district, if you're anywhere down there, it doesn't have to be in the stadiums. You could be uh, enjoying one of those bars or clubs or restaurants down there. You might be anywhere from a quarter mile to a half mile from a hill that you can go up. So you've got five or six minutes to do something. Um, I hope you're in good shape. So again, and I don't think this is bad advice. You know, it's good advice, but it's, uh, you know, problematic in Seattle. And this one is kind of a weird one. I just discovered these a few weeks ago. I found, I went looking because I was very frustrated at finding little information. In my novel, People are saved on the waterfront because one police officer, you know, you like to write heroes into stories, right? Because one police officer got in her car and drove up the full length of Alaskan Way and got on her loudspeaker and said, everybody hurry to higher ground. Everybody leave what you're doing right now and go to higher ground. And she went and did that. And, you know, in the story, she gets a medal for it and all kinds of things. But um, these are, are uh, this is an enigma to me. What we're looking at is in 2000, they installed three sets of these great big speakers, one at the north end of the waterfront, you know, up at Pier uh, 71 or whatever that is up at that end. 
and all the way down through the fire station five in the middle by Ivers, there was one of these, and another down by the stadiums. And I went looking for them uh, during the great shakeout. I went down when the shakeout event happened and stood at Ivers and I listened to hear what I would hear on the earthquake rehearsal drill. I heard nothing. Uh, and the towers are gone. They took them away. I'm not sure what's up with that. And another worry. I guess you could call me the world's biggest worry wart. And again, this showed up in my story, um, dram dramatizing what's going to happen. But the Highway 99 tunnels are below sea level, OK? Uh, but city planners have taken care of some kind of adequate protection measures, right? Or maybe not. So let's have a look around. This is one of their uh, computer graphics of, you know, just as they were installing this, they put this out as a public service. And as you will recall, over on the left, that is right on the waterfront. That is flat. It's it's 16 feet above mean tide, mean, mean uh, sea level. <clears throat> and the all the greenery that you see planted around this freeway interchange is at that grade. OK, so it's at ground level, let's say. And then uh, if you look down low in this picture, you'll see two one entrance, uh, excuse me, two entrances to the northbound highway plunging down below grade level. And then up above at the other end, you see the southbound exit. Okay, so that's a schematic of where I'm going to take you on a little tour. So another look at that uh, southbound entrance. And as you can see, it is. Uh, or excuse me, southbound exit. It is rimmed by a wall of some kind. It isn't just a wall going down, it's a wall going up. But uh, don't keep, don't get your hopes up too far. Here's a look at that. I, I, w I went walking around and I took my camera and I took a picture of the wall that encloses that uh, freeway entrance. And that's it with all those bars on it. Okay, it's that that long gray wall in the middle there with the bars on it. Look to the extreme left of that wall and you'll see a sedan, not even a big car. It's taller than that wall. That wall is right around three feet. So you're at 16 feet above uh, mean tide level plus three. And that's it. And I just don't think that's adequate. And if you look over on the far uh, right at that wall, you'll see that it just ends. And uh, the, what you see is a bunch of freeway signs beyond that. And of course, those signs are way up and over the traffic. So there's a big drop right behind the end of that wall. Well, I went over, I, I couldn't exactly walk through traffic to look at the end of that wall, but I got uh, some perspective on it. And there's nothing there. It, it's at ground level. There isn't, there isn't a three foot barrier there. So, you know, so I was researching this novel and I was not, <laughs> I'm not pleased with what I was seeing. Uh, here's an example of one of those uh, northbound entrances. You see this SUV going down into the underground portion. You see again that there's a wall three, maybe four feet tall here, but they're actually gonna add fill and planting. So it's about three feet tall. But look what it does here at this crosswalk. It comes right down to ground level. Okay, so again, you've got water could get in at ground level into the tunnels. Um, and this is the other one. And there's a picture of my car as I was driving through places I wasn't supposed to be taking these photographs. Um, Fortunately, no construction people or police came along while I was uh, wandering through here. But uh, it's a nice shot showing, again, about three feet uh, around this particular exit. Here's a view from inside, a, a news photo. Um, and that three-foot wall is up there above. But get, get the scale here. Look not at this first guy, but look back at the people coming out back there. 
you can see that the drop then is, you know, what, about 30 feet down. Um, and just imagine, you know, an eight foot tidal wave sending the top five feet over the top of that, how quickly it would fill that space. So I think we have a real concern here. And I, I simplistically, I think they ought to build some walls that are quite a bit bigger around this. Um, so uh, there we go. I guess I already answered my own question. I think we should build some taller walls in that area. Uh, I guess somebody could say, well, you know, if the last earthquake swamped the area in 900 AD, it's been 1100 years, do we really have to worry? And, and on the one side, you could say, oh, it's a pretty rare event. On the other side, you could say, aren't we overdue? So, uh, and powerless in Seattle. Now, here is the, I'm going to show you another problem. Okay, this is the Massachusetts Street substation right down there by the stadiums. <clears throat> and I took this picture standing in the street. And again, this is at the four to eight foot level above the highest tides, well, four above the highest high tides. And it carries one third of downtown Seattle's electric power. And its barriers against vandals, I think, are good. They look really effective. Its barriers against water are non existent. So, uh, a power outage if a tidal wave comes in here is going to be a certainty. And as I say, a third of downtown. Uh, and then the West Seattle Bridge uh, was a marvel of modern engineering. What went wrong? Uh, in my story, uh, I simply put an end to this long agony that we're having because I had the center span right here in the middle drop away for a stretch of about 60 feet. Uh, and I, again, you know, dramatizing, I had some people just driving up this side and it fell away in front of them and they, uh, <clears throat> they, gee, I can't say, I guess you'll have to read the book to find out what happened to them. But uh, <clears throat> in researching that, I, I came upon some other issues. And in fact, <clears throat> The problem with the bridge might actually stem from just what I'm going to tell you about here. Uh, so it cracked in just the way, that, you know, these small cracks that it has now are the same cracks that I described in the earthquake. Um, maybe they were caused by small earthquakes, but there's something more sinister. Uh, what if Harbor Island is creeping to the side? Um, I think that's a pretty difficult thing for any, uh, you know, geologist or hydrologist or engineer to really pin down. I'd love at some point to talk to one of the engineers who's now grappling with this problem. I mean, uh, they, it's not really a problem, is it? They're going to knock this bridge down, right? It's decided that it's got to come down. Uh, but um, I'd love to find out exactly what kind of torsions or whatever, because, you know, I'm thinking it may not just be pulling apart, it might be twisting, which is what I would expect it to do, given the scenario of Valdez, Alaska. Um, in 1965, in that big earthquake, one thing that happened in Valdez, they had a very similar landfill on top of mudflats, and it slid into Valdez Harbor. And it generated that huge legendary tidal wave that swept down and went right over the top of a number of islands, uh, inhabited islands, some of them uh, in the, you know, to, on the south side of Alaska. So the notion of a subsidence of Harbor Island, the whole thing slipping into Puget Sound, when you shake it up and down, Who's to say? But now, as I re as I look on this news item uh, of the cracks in this uh, this bridge, uh, realize that the Seattle Fault runs right behind that. You know, back where that there's a, a white dome shaped thing and the tip of a bridge you can see back there. The fault is right about there, maybe a little bit farther south, but it's right there. Um, on the other hand, it hasn't let loose lately. You know, other faults around the area have shaken us a bit. Well, one thing that might happen in such shaking 
is that any creep in the Harbor Island, Phil, uh, might have, you know, maybe that's why after, you know, what was it, the three lakes, uh, it was a 4.0 up, up in the Snohomish uh, area. Uh, I think they call it the three lakes quake. Um, that, that rattled me halfway out of bed. And uh, you have to wonder what it did to this bridge. But then they suddenly say, gosh, where'd those cracks come from? Well, my thought is, yeah, a 4.0 isn't going to crack that bridge, but Harbor Island might. I realize they sunk it down into hard ground, but the surface might flow and pull against the pilings. Uh, well, or the piers, you know, we, we may never know. In fact, let's hope we don't ever know. Let's hope they knock it down, build something stronger, maybe more steel in it. Uh, and I guess I'll leave it at that. So good guys, we've had enough uh, of troubles. And you know, who, who's gonna help us with this? Seismologists, emergency planners, emergency response people. And here's one of my favorite good guys. He helped me a lot with this. Uh, seismologist uh, Bill Steele of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. I caught him right in the act of watching his monitors in, the, in the, their seismic center. Some of this stuff is just uh, teaching screens they use for training students and everything. And that's especially true of the old rolling drum seismographs there. They're just historic. But these are actually live feeds that he's looking at here on the, on the four screens that you see there. And um, he was very helpful to me in, in writing the novel and, and to have some accuracy for the geological underpinnings of what I'm talking about. Here's another view of those monitors and they can switch around. They have hundreds of monitors around our area now monitoring everything. I do like to point out in this picture, note what's on the desk front and center. Uh, a copy of my previous novel, Rainier Erupts. <laughs> that was very satisfying to see there. Um, and I, I don't know if I have anything more to say about this. Uh, uh, obviously, they would be pivotal in getting out uh, word of what the magnitude of a fault uh, rupture on, on the Seattle Fault was, but that would then be kind of retrospective already. It's going to be the fire department and other places who are going to be more responsible. Uh, this guy is a guy I've gotten to know well, uh, Colonel Randolph Petgrave here on the left. <clears throat> He's uh, with the Army. Uh, planning group, you know, planning for National Guard responses and uh, what we call our military department here in the state of Washington. Uh, and, and he, you know, helped me. He actually read the book while I was writing it to make sure that I had the accuracy of how quickly a response could be mounted, you know, and I, I had settled on probably several days before you really could have a relief effort even if you went at top speed. And he said, yeah, in fact, you're thinking quicker than I am. So uh, that's a scary aspect of this. Although it's really good to know that we've got a, an excellent uh, military operation at Fort Lewis and a, a regional disaster center at Fort Lewis. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we'll be in the best of hands should the day come. Uh, here's some more, another buddy of mine now after all this. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hans Bly of the 446th Airlift Wing. He is uh, he, he does things like take relief flights, these great big giant planes that can carry cars and I think maybe even tanks. Uh, they fly around the world on relief missions. And of course, they would be flying a relief mission from right here. They'd, they'd be coming out of McCord Air Force Base and they would be shuttling out to get supplies, emergency supplies, and bringing them in to the Seattle area. <clears throat> and last but not least of these hero responders, this it was so wonderful that day. I went and knocked on the door down there and I got what it's hard to get. I got a personal tour by the captain of the, the fireboat Leshai. Uh, what a wonderful tour that was. They've got four engines down there. Any one in the center of that boat, four engines, any of them that could run uh, a boat like this 
two of them turn propellers and two of them turn water pumps of monstrous size, just gigantic water pumps to feed as many as five of these uh, monitors, as they call them, that gun, those guns up above them, they're called monitors. And they uh, can train those on a fire with different kinds of nozzles and things. That was a wonderful day. And this is the guy, by the way, we were up in the, uh, the bridge or the, um, um, well, anyway, up there. <laughs> um, and talking about how he runs the ship and the sonar radar and all the radio communications that he would use in a disaster day. Um, and I said to him, I, I described to him what I've, I've already described to you that uh, it, it's, um, there would be a really big wave coming around the bend from West Seattle. And he said, yeah, I know we train for that kind of thing. And it's really hard to train for it. And I've often stopped to look out and think, what would we do if that wave came? And uh, he didn't really have an answer. He said, I don't know if we could get underway in that time. Well, I guess we'd try. And the bad guy. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about native legends because it's always fun, whether it be with uh, glaciation or floods or whatever, uh, to talk about the native take on these things. And with a, an earthquake happening just in 900 AD, there really are legends in this area of what they call Atyahos. Atyahos, the serpent, the two-headed serpent spirit who brings both earthquakes and tsunamis. And if you think about it, of course he'd bring both, just like the fire guys said, <laughs> it's one, one alarm. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, just in case you missed it, you can go around. This is uh, a Til Tilikum village over on Blake Island. When you walk off the boat and, and go up to have your salmon dinner and watch the dancers, you cross under Ayahos. He's being supplicated here to be a nice boy on this day, along with Thunderbird, to keep an eye on things uh, so that nothing, no trouble happens. And uh, here's a closer image of Ayahos from... I don't know, it looks like they had another post that rotted out or something, but there's a good look at him. He's always depicted as a two-headed snake. And uh, here's on the upper right, uh, the Tamale or Tamalik of the Quileute people uh, has one, uh, something that is very commonly depicted and that is a wave. You can just see that wave in this creature's shape. And uh, it's just a very widespread legend. And this is a Kwakiutl from British Columbia in his Sisiutl dancing mask. So uh, all over, and, and with good reason, right? Because we've got the subduction zone all the way up and down the coast. And then we've got all these smaller faults that can cause earthquakes and tidal waves. So it's a very common legend. And so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to stop and ask the rhetorical question, have you seen Ahiahos lately? And I, in the 2001 Nisqually quake, I was at home in my writing office and I actually kind of did the wrong thing. When that thing slammed my house sideways, instead of ducking, covering and holding on, I ran out onto my back deck and, uh, in a way, I'm glad I did because I looked across at the neighbor's yard. He has a big lawn and a couple of big trees. And that lawn was rippling like ripples in water. Uh, just the whole yard in, in big yard long ripples going up and down. And the two big trees in his yard were uh, teetering together and apart and together and apart. It was a visual that I will never forget. <clears throat> And here's, here's what we're talking about. I don't, I don't think it's worth all the time to go into the detail, but uh, if you just go from the upper left, there are compression waves and an earthquake. There are sideways shaking and shattering waves called love waves. There are S waves that are like ripples and then a longer, slower Raleigh wave that goes farther. And that's pretty much what I would have seen all the way in West Seattle looking at waves that came from the Nisqually quake. But as I say, 
if I were a wood carver, I might try to capture this in wood and I would probably start carving Ayahos. So it's very understandable how the natives have these legends. And I guess I'm coming to the end of it all here. And I'd like to thank the people. I've actually already mentioned every one of these. So oh, Sandy Doton uh, is one who helped to inspire me to begin this project. She uh, wrote the book Full Rip 9.0. Some of you may have read that where uh, a 9.0 quake on the subduction zone and what that might entail and the history of how people found the landforms that sort of proved the theory that that sort of thing happens. And uh, yes, I think I've covered everybody. Okay. Um, so thanks and stay safe. <laughs> if you're interested in checking out the book, if you have a cell phone either now or actually uh, this, I understand this will be put up online. If you come and click on that little code down there in the bottom with your code reader, it'll take you right to the page. But believe me, it's not hard to find on Amazon or, or anywhere. All the booksellers, Apple books, all of them sell it. So just Google it and you'll find it. And I do believe I have uh, finished up with what I've got to say. So let me get the screen going back the other way now. Uh, let's see. Oh, stop share. Okay. There we go. All right. And it's time for some applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I realize yeah. a little different, you know, uh, people don't often come in starting from a fictional point of view with most of the presentations, but you can see how writing fiction led me into all this fact finding. Well, it's time for our question and answer session here. And judging from the last two times, you and the audience prefer to type your questions in chat. If you'd like to do that, you're welcome to do that. Um, I would be very comfortable with you just holding down your space bar and asking your question of Tom out loud. Either way works fine. I have a question. What would happen with Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish as far as will they generate waves? Uh, yes. Um, they. The fault runs under both of those. So, uh, you know, it, it depends a little bit. The reason I hesitate is because one of the questions that immediately comes up when one discusses uh, a quake on the Seattle fault and what its magnitude would be, which is part of what you're asking, is it big enough to actually send tidal waves on those lakes? Um, and then part of the answer is, well, how much of the fault ruptures? Does is it such a big release that the whole fault shatters along its whole length? In which case, you know, then your answer to your question becomes quite simple. You know, you've ripped the whole fault and it goes under both those lakes. They're both going to have an, a section go up 20 or 30 feet and it's going to shove a 20 or 30 feet wave down the lake. So, um, so you see what I'm saying? So there's an if in there. If it ruptures in that area, then Yes, big waves. I see a question from Barry. Barry asks, could buildings and homes potentially be lifted 25 feet? Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> uh, I mean, if you, I mean, just ponder, you know, the mass that's moving here, you know, even a, a tall skyscraper is just a feather compared to the mass of earth that is moving. So I, I don't, you know, it's, it's a good question, really a very good question of how, how it's gonna influence things. But I think the answer really is, you know, absolutely yes. If, if you're in an area where it goes up 25 feet, in fact, I have, I have this in the book and I put a little humor in this, this old guy's living where he just barely has a view and this, house is lifted up 25 feet and he's cleaning up the damage. He goes, you know, I got a lot better view now. <laughs> so, um, but the simple answer is, well, I, again, I wrote it in the book because, you know, having researched what was possible, oh, absolutely lifting up a house 
uh, I didn't dwell on the one thing, you know, I, I did mention that I, I didn't have the dark heart to knock down skyscrapers in Seattle to any extent. I had just one skyscraper I put in. It was an unscrupulous builder who was building what was to be the tallest building in Seattle. He wanted to get above everybody else. He was scrimping and cutting in corners on some of the bracing. And you might imagine. I'll just leave it to your imagination and or read the book. But I didn't knock down all the skyscrapers in Seattle. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't knock down the space. Needs. And so that's why I chose 7.8, because that logically stops short of just things you just don't even want to think about. And it actually leaves Seattle in a better state for a dramatization, because then people, you know, they're in an intact stadium that wasn't knocked down are they gonna run out to their death in a tsunami? And, and can some hero rise up to stop them? And those are the kind of things you put into fiction. And I don't know, because again, in researching that, I did not find clear evidence that the authorities would take, take a hand. I, it, I didn't, I, you know, when I really pressed the Seahawks, I started getting answers back from their fan, pages saying, we're glad you're taking such an interest in the Seahawks. We'll get back to you on that. You know, and it came back from their fan relations. You know, they, they don't want to think, you know, they want to go out and say, hey, let's all talk about an earthquake and a tsunami. You know, they don't want to talk about that. So it's hard to get much information. We have a question from Marilyn Poole. Marilyn is asking if you would speak to the clockwise rotation and uh, the slow earthquakes. Slow earthquake. I don't, I, I would need a little more information. I haven't, I, I've never heard of the clockwise rotation. So um, I'm probably not going to have an answer here, but I wonder what rotation of, is this the rotation of um, our, what do they call it? Terrain or whatever the, the, the geological uh, subunit on which we're sitting. I'm not sure. So I, I'm, I'm not quite tracking on that question. But I'd be happy with a little more information. Right, Mary Lynn, could you speak to that? Where, was that what you were discussing? By the way, this is my favorite mug here. I don't know if you can see, but that's Meteor Crater. I got my, I got my souvenir mug down at Meteor Crater. Um, Nick Sentner has uh, provided a lot of information uh, for us on the web having to do with the clockwise ro rotation mm. of the earth of all of the um, of all of Washington, certainly up against Canada, and yeah. slow earthquakes happening every, what is it, every 14 months. Oh, um, yes, I'm getting a lot of detail here. A lot slow. of relatively slow. new slow. knowledge, and I maybe it's too complicated for your no, no, no. Slow slip events. Yes. And and I did, I get I got it right. It took me a while to think of what you're talking about. But yeah, the whole chunk that we're on has that clockwise rotation. And what that's see, that isn't all there is. There's compression from the north and south while it's being it's sort of being squished in a clockwise direction. Um, and yes, now that I, I, there was a word missing. Yes, the slow slip quakes. Yeah, because the quakes aren't slow. That's what was throwing me off. The quakes are the normal quake. Yikes, you know, they happen right away. Yeah, but You don't but, even feel them. Pardon me? They're slow, you don't even feel them. Well, yeah, no, I think we're gonna have to agree to disagree here. They happen, what, what happens is you might have a thousand of them in a couple of days and they all go boom, 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 and you don't feel them. The net effect is a slow slip. So yeah, I do. I, I know that. In fact, in the book, there they they have. Uh, I have my geologists who are studying this. They're at the seism seismology center, talking about slow slip. Absolutely, I, I I'm am aware of it, and I wrote it into the book. And they, uh, you know, early on in the story, they're debating. Boy, there's this slow slip. It's getting a little faster. You know, is this a building up to an event? Is this some kind of a, you know, pre prelude to a bigger quake? And well, well, you know, nobody's ever established that, but they're sitting around wondering. And then of course it hits. 
so yes, you know, your question is a good one. And absolutely, that that is in the book. So it, it's it's material that I covered, you know, it took me three years to write the book. I think it was less than one year of writing and reading scientific articles and, and visiting Zentner. You know, I, I've watched many of his videos, um, you know, so uh, all that stuff figures in this quite a bit. Elaine is asking, oh. would some land subside? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, again, the uh, up at uh, Discovery Point, um, they've got what looks like a two foot tsunami sand uh, layer above the artifacts and shells and, and uh, um, hearths that they found there. But there's a level above that. And it's a, a new sea bottom off, you know, it's right off the point and, uh, or it was right off the point until it filled in. And uh, that was water above the land that used to be there. So uh, there, there has been since the 8900 quake, some amount of subsidence. They're sure that they're looking at evidence of that subsidence. So, um, Probably the truth of it is subsidence is ongoing. You know, I've been watching in West Seattle. I've lived there all my life. Um, <clears throat> been watching the bulkheads that they put in there subside. They they keep getting going down. And I was thinking, wow, you know, uh, ocean rise is happening faster than I, I thought it would. You know, when I was a kid, this was a whole bulkhead. Now it's just a little short, stubby wall where there's a whole bunch of concrete under the sand here. I'm, I'm thinking that if somebody could get out there, if they could retroactively go back to the 50s or whenever, when I was a kid there, and then come forward to now and do some very precise measurements, I think they're probably going to find subsidence because that's the first point. The, the fault is to the south when you're on Alki Beach. The fault is to the south of you, and it's it's that kind of ridge that goes right out onto Alki Point. That is the fault, uh, the overriding part of it. So there, there is what looks, I mean, it looks to me personally like subsidence since I was a kid there at the bulkheads on the sandy beach. Uh, and that's, you know, just my anecdote. But the scientists have got numbers on the likely subsidence of several feet at West Point. So, and if West Point went down, it didn't, it didn't go down on a fault. Seattle went down. Everything went. All, everything north of the fault has gone down a couple of feet since 8900. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, Tom, uh, I noticed the videos from the uh, Ind Indonesian earthquake and tsunami of uh, what was that? Five years ago, four or five years ago, mm -hmm. that a lot of people were videoing upper yeah. levels of upper story buildings. And mm -hmm. so wouldn't there be a survival rate for people who live in some of these high rises on the upper levels, as long as the high rise stands, yeah. uh, hasn't fallen, uh, because they would be above the floodwaters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you're bringing up a, a, a general idea there, too. You know, I think I might have forgot to mention as I went along um, in the stadiums. I mean, the right answer is to uh, don't, you know, if the stadium isn't falling down, <laughs> I'll tell you this, if I'm at a game and the stadium doesn't fall down, I'm not getting out of there. I, I won't leave there for at least a half hour, you know, no way. And that's, that's the answer, you know, get in a structure and be above the tidal waves uh, highest watermark. And yeah, you're right, you know, the, some of the Indonesian, you could just see that they'd be in like a, a, a motel along the beach and they're on the second floor on their balcony filming. And down below them, you hear the crunching of glass. Here, the first floor is getting flooded and filled with water. And they're just up one floor. And they were taking pictures of it. So yes, very apt point. And it would be true downtown. You know, there's all the, all the, there's housing and hotels in the stadium areas. And yeah, the right choice for people there is hesitate some minutes before you think about leaving. I mean, you gotta be scared, you know, is this place gonna collapse? It just shook like mad, is it now gonna fall? But I would say, 
it's certain death out there on the street if a tidal wave comes. You know, even a tidal wave of maybe two feet, that would sweep you into a seething mass of tumbling garbage cans and broken splintered wood and everything. And that's just death at just a couple of feet tall. Uh, I have a really touching scene there where a father runs out with his two kids and they, they want to keep running and he grabs and says, wait, I don't think we should be doing this. And uh, he's heard about tidal waves. And the, the guy, the announcer had finally, well, I don't want to give away too much. But anyway, father saves sons. And what he saw was this tidal wave coming. And it was only a couple of feet tall. Everybody had hit, it just knocked them right down and they were gone. So uh, giving you a little example of the kind of fiction that's, you know, it's not very far from the truth if this day ever comes. Which it will, you know, really. I mean, this this fault is active. It's no less active than it ever was. Other questions for Tom? I see Tim Hay has his hand up. Tim, yeah. hold down your space bar. Pressure, space bar. There. There you go, Tim. Hey, unmuted myself. Uh, yeah. You said you called the location of the failure of the West Seattle Bridge. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, well, they, uh, you know, I saw this on a news segment, I think it was online. They were showing how they were getting up underneath the center span and uh, seeing cracks that, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember their time frame, whether it was just last year there weren't any cracks or whether we had been following these cracks mm -hmm. and they've gone from something that we thought was tolerable to something we think is a public risk that we've got to shut down the bridge. Um, <clears throat> they, you know, I, I will say, I, I don't know the exact, I mean, <laughs> hey, I'd love to get up there with the engineers up on a crane and have a look at this, but no, I haven't, haven't seen it that close. But uh, they did have some video footage of the cracks and, you know, they don't look all that terrible. I mean, the, the, the structure of the bridge is intact, but there's all these really squirrely crack lines going through it. And then you need an engineer to decide whether that's some kind of superficial thing. And I guess the engineers decided, no, those squirrely cracks are deep. And I, I'm, you know, again, I don't, I'm not privy to that detail. Uh, it wasn't part of my research originally because, you know, it didn't, didn't hadn't happened. <laughs> um, so that's, I guess, as far as I can take that answer because uh, I don't know any more about it. Thanks. Good question, though. Tom has his hand up. I wanted to know about how the Seattle Basin might figure into this since it runs basically from the fault north under all of Seattle and all the way to Lake Sammamish. Uh, yes. Uh, there, there's, uh, let's put it this way, the Seattle Basin and the Seattle Fault are a unit. So you're asking, you know, how does it figure in? Yeah, it figures all right. It's what it is, is it's the downward half of an overthrust, right? The whole thing, all the way from up there around uh, uh, West Point, all down through Elliott Bay and across through the lakes, you know, just as you suggest, all of that is going down, you know, in, in one of those classic, uh, overthrust situations so it's it's being borne down it's being pressed down by the pressure of what's rising over it the, the fault doesn't go straight into the earth here it goes on a very steep angle really yeah it, it's uh, or i shouldn't say steep <laughs> a very shallow angle yeah it's like a 30 degree angle or something yeah. like that uh, from the north down to the south okay and the, the part to the south then is rising up on that line and 
And as you're asking, you know, all of Elliott Bay, all of downtown Seattle, even though it's on a hill, it's still going down. Um, it like, looks to me like there would be some pretty heavy loss of footings for large structures like bridges and stadiums and whatnot. At least a loss of level, if not the loss of structural strength. Yeah. Um, all those things kind of start to come into the variability of the exact quake. You know, how, how much of the area did slip? Is it the full length or is it just one part of it? Um, th that is a variable, you know, uh, and, and the outcome will, will depend on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Art has a question, Art. No, oh, we can't hear you, Art. Still not hearing you. Can there you, hear you go. Okay, yeah. yes. Uh, more of an observation. From some of the scenarios you've shown us, which seem very realistic, um, the flooding of the um, Highway 99 tunnel seems like it's uh, unpreventable. In other words, you could raise those walls that you showed us, which were only three, three and a half feet high, but unless you extend them all the way back, away from the tunnel entrance, uh, I don't know how far, half a mile or more, water is still going to uh, flood the roadway and move toward the tunnel uh, on the yep. roadway. I and agree. It, it strikes me that the only way you can mitigate uh, totally uh, a disaster like that is to simply not build at all in that flood zone. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't know if that was a part of the debate. Remember how many votes there were on whether we would or would not build a tunnel? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, and the, nay, the nays might have had it if uh, a lot of consideration was given to this. You, you kind of overstated the case, though. It isn't an absolute you know, in this case, it wouldn't be damned if you do and damned if you don't. It would be you did, and so you're damned. <laughs> but um, some retrofit, let's put it this way. So if there are areas where you can't keep the water from coming in, still, if you could keep it from coming in down that whole length of that long wall that I was showing you, uh, you ought to at least slow it, which then might allow people to survive in the tunnels, you know. So um, I, I think it's probably a worthwhile thing to consider. I don't, I'm not going to exactly go out and launch a crusade to, uh, to get this done. Uh, but I, I actually do, you know, now that I've had such a hard look at it, I absolutely think it should be done. There should be a retrofit to raise some walls in that area. Um, and it, uh, the, 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 the image I showed you where I was standing at a crosswalk and a car was going down from there, it has struck me since that time I've been back to that area and I thought, you know, they could bring a bunch of dump trucks in here and build up so that as you came from the city streets, you would go up a ramp and then turn and go down mm -hmm. to now a newly fixed up tunnel entrance that was well above tidal wave level. So, you know, you, there might actually be solutions. You're, you're absolutely right in a way. If you're coming from street level, how can you possibly, you can't build a wall across <laughs> the entrance to the tunnel. So there's that, there's a conundrum there, but you see, uh, having been back there, I've thought of that. And, and if you make mounds, if you raise it up and then go down in, you, you can get say a 10 foot wall or 12 foot wall around it. And that should protect it from most anything that would come along. We have a question from Eric. Eric asks, what are the threats in the North Sound, Everett, Woodby Island, and Camino Island? Yeah, you know, I'm a little less familiar with those, but I do know that, uh, you know, while I was researching this, they had a slow slip event, like we were talking about just a little while ago, where there were many, many quakes, and it was running up to the north of, let's see, was it Everett? No, it's farther north, I think. Almost all the way up to uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is all part of this. Um, anyway, there, there, uh, 
there is, how can I put this? There are lots of faults. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, there's a Tacoma fault. And I think if I remember right, there's an Everett fault. I think so. And, and you know, part of what uh, uh, goes on here is that the landforms, you know, this group is very interested in landforms, right? Uh, Ice Age land forming events. Uh, well, here we have uh, something, you know, since the Ice Age and the harbors around here tend to have something to do with faults. Uh, I wouldn't want to make too abject a claim like that, you know, that they all do, but certainly Commencement Bay is right on the Tacoma Fault. Elliott Bay, as, as we've gone through in detail, is formed by the subsidence. Most of them are subsiding on the north and rising on the south, most of them. But even there, a couple of them turn around and do the opposite. It's a chaotic area and there are north-south strikes of faults as well. So very, very complex area. If there's any comfort to it, you know, all of this, they're called crustal faults. They are not subduction zone continental faults. So they're all much smaller so we can all Breathe a sigh of relief that you know 9.0 is probably just strictly impossible in our area, um, and then the good news is with inverse square law, you know the the amount of shaking that you get from a 9.0 that's 30 miles offshore is is uh, you have a lot more trouble with a 7.0 under your feet than you do with a 9.0 out there. Well, Tom, we certainly appreciate you coming tonight and speaking with us. Very interesting. We're all going to want to go out and find your book, whether from the QR code or from Amazon or at our local bookstore. And um, I have two new books because I had never heard of your Rainier book either. I'm ashamed to say. So I have some reading in my future. Well, that one's fun. Yeah, I sank the floating bridges with that one, uh, with a with a lahar mud flow. But uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoy them both. Thank you, Thank you Tom. Thanks, Tom. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Thank you, Tom. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. <laughs>